Let's pray. Lord God, we hasten toward a day when earthly pleasures and pursuits will all appear vain. It will not matter on that day whether we were rich or poor, whether we were admired or despised, whether we were healthy or sick. But on that day, it will matter. Did we mourn over sin? Did we hunger and thirst for righteousness? And did we cry out from the heart, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner? Lord, in this moment, set our minds and hearts on that day. For the glory of Jesus Christ, amen. We'll open together to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6 will be the first text that we turn to today. And I just love this passage in 1 Timothy 6, starting in verse 6 and going down to verse 19 because it's, uh, it's just so classic and true to the, to the way life works. We're here in church and we're singing praises, glory be to God the Father and glory be to God the Son, and we're praying about that ultimate day of judgment. And this is, we're here in church... But it, maybe a a few moments ago, on the way to church, your baby blew out her diaper. Or when you were walking out the door, your cat threw up. All these little things happen in life. And then we we go and we we sing and, and and we meditate on that final day. That's the way that life is. And the more I read the Bible, the more I realize that's the way the Bible is. This passage in 1 Timothy 6 is absolutely classic because it starts with this very earthly advice about money. And when I was little, when, when I would uh, play, play with money, with uh, not play money, but real money, like dollar bills and coins, my mom would always say, go wash your hands. There's nothing dirtier than money. And she didn't mean that it was like morally dirty. She just meant it passes through everyone's hands and it gets sneezed on and you need to wash your hands after you handle money. Money is so earthly. And this passage is like, about money, do this and that and the other thing. And then you'll see that it's going to switch to this absolutely epic statement about the eternal glory of God and the inapproachable light that our holy God dwells in. And then it'll come right back down to give you advice. uh, If you have $200, do this with it, not that with it. I love the way the Bible is like that because the Bible is meant to lead us through a life that's like that. So look with me at 1 Timothy 6. We'll read from verse uh, 6 down on through. It says here, godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world but if we have food and clothing with these we will be content but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life for which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time he who is the blessed and only sovereign the king of kings the lord of lords who alone has immortality and who dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see to him be honor and eternal dominion amen 
as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. I just love how this text takes us from the cosmic heights of Christ's lordship and the inapproachable holiness of God down to the small decisions we make with $40 here and $60 there. How do we think about and manage money? And have we, have you figured out how what you do with $60 here and $20 there actually relates to the God who dwells in unapproachable light? Or do we just do with money what our parents did with it or what the people around us do with it? I think we're, I, I think that we are more comfortable with sins of greed and pride in possessions and selfish acquisitiveness than, than we should be because we have a blind spot that everyone around us has and we just tend to use money the way that everyone else around us does. Therefore, we need godly guidance. And that's what I've tried to prepare from God's word this morning is a, a sermon, not, a, not an exposition of one passage, but more of a topical understanding to give godly guidance in this area of money and finances in order to help you understand how and what you do with $20 here and $60 there relates to God and his calling in your life. So I um, want to give you five, uh, five pieces of godly guidance uh, about money. Number one, don't love money, love God with all your heart. That's number one. It's a, a don't and a do. Don't love money, love God with all your heart. Don't love money, but love God with all your heart. This is the beautiful tension here in 1 Timothy 6 because he says in verse 10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So he says, don't love money because if you love money, it leads to all sorts of evil. So don't love money. Rather, love God with all your heart. But I love the fact that after he says don't love money, in case somebody thinks, well, Having a lot of money is automatically bad. He comes back around and he says in verse 17, if you're rich in this present age, then use that money to glorify God and then to do good and to be generous and share with others. There's a real balance here. It says don't love money and then it comes back around and says, but the, the goal isn't necessarily to be poor. The goal is to store up treasure in heaven by understanding why and how money matters. Store up treasure in heaven by being a good steward of what God has given you. God owns all that is on the earth. This was the point of the sermon last week in this old two-part series. And God shares everything with us because he loves us. And what we do with what God has shared with us shows what we love and what we believe is good and even what we believe is godly. And so we shouldn't love money. We should love God with all our heart. And we should, the way we use money should show the way that we love God. Let me warn you that it is possible to love money too much. Verse 10 says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Remember the parable of the soils? How often we think about the parable of the soils? We, I think we think about it often because this, that's one of those Bible passages that we see played out like every year in our youth ministry. Every year in our church ministry, we see uh, the signs of fruit and then we see is it gonna remain or not? In uh, Luke chapter eight, verse 14, listen to what God, listen to what Jesus says about money and the seed of the gospel. The seed that fell among the thorns 
represented those people who hear the word of God, but as they go on their way, the seed is choked out by the cares and riches of this life, and so their fruit does not remain. The Lord Jesus Christ actually says in Luke chapter 8, verse 14, that the good seed of the gospel ministry can be choked out in your life by your attitude about money. This is a warning that we should heed. Don't love money. Love God with all your heart. Let's love God. Let's love his word. Let's love gospel ministry and gospel opportunities, not money. Well, that's the first piece of godly guidance. The second is this. Don't be anxious about money, but trust God to provide for you. Don't be anxious about money, but trust God to provide for you. Don't be anxious about money, but trust God to provide for you. And the the first point is don't love money. And the second point is don't be anxious about money. And the reason these go together is because, have you ever thought about this? Have you ever thought about this? Love and anxiety go together. Love and anxiety go together like chocolate and peanut butter, like coffee and kringle. Love and anxiety go together because why would you be anxious about something you don't care about. The things that we are most anxious about are the things and always the things that we love the most. Don't be anxious about money, but trust God to provide for you. I suppose the place to turn here is that wonderful Jesus saying in Matthew chapter six about anxiety over finances. Matthew chapter six starting in verse 24. Matthew chapter six, uh, starting in verse 24. He says, uh, after saying, don't lay up treasures on earth, but lay up treasure in heaven. He says in verse 24, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value, more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of those. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, don't be anxious, saying, what shall we eat and what shall we drink and what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Jesus here is saying very clearly, don't be anxious about money. Trust God to provide for you. Notice the therefore in verse 25. The close connection between serving money and being anxious about money, between serving, loving, being devoted to money, and then being anxious about it because we're anxious about what we're devoted to. We're anxious about what we love. Christian, God is calling you here to trust Christ, trust God's character. God's eyes are on you. God's hand can always reach you. God knows and he cares about you. God has knowledge and care of the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. And God has even more tender knowledge and care of you. Trust God. God's name, Genesis 22 verse 14, God's name is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides, the Lord who provides. That's the very name of God. The providence of God is an essential attribute of the deity. Quick definition of providence. God's providence 
is that continual exercise of the divine energy whereby the creator preserves all of his creatures and is operative in all that comes to pass in the world and directs all things to their appointed end. Providence is one of the attributes of God, like his holiness, like his justice, like his love. I don't, I really can't remember hearing one of you say, God isn't holy. We don't deny God's attribute of holiness. But how often? I'm, I'm only hurting you because I love you. How often have I seen or heard you doubt God's providence? It's a regular occurrence for us. What would it be like if every day that you lived, this was riveted in your mind? God's providence is that continual exercise of the divine energy by, whereby the creator preserves all of his creatures, is operative in all things that come to pass in the world, and directs all things in the world to their appointed end. What would it feel like to have that assurance every moment? To trust God's providence. And our problem is that though we think God is wise in the small incidents when we need something, we immediately know that our wisdom about what we need and when we need it is correct. And so God's providence must in this case be misguided. But, pro but trust, trust puts the outcome in God's hands, not what we would have, but what God would have for us. When you're choosing a shoe for your little one to wear, you don't pick the first shoe that she points at or cries about. You pick the one that fits her foot so she can do what she needs to do. Not what we would have, but what God would have for us. This is God's providence in our life. Trust God's character. His eye sees you. His hand can reach you. No matter how broke you are, his hand can provide for you. Don't be anxious about money, but trust God's providence. Well, there's a third bit of godly guidance that I hope is helpful for you, and that's this. Don't be lazy. Work hard for God's glory. Don't be lazy. Work hard for God's glory. I suppose the classic of statement of this is the Sabbath command. Because the Sabbath command is a command to rest one day out of seven. But actually, in the, in the way that the Sabbath command is described in Exodus, what it says is this, you shall work six days and you shall rest one day out of the seven. God creates us in his image to work. Take God's providence. There's a small way that we mirror that. When we exercise dominion and when we work and when we take care of the things around us, don't be lazy. Work hard for God's glory. Hard work is good. Hard work is a gift. Hard work is meant to keep you from poverty. Listen to what the Proverbs say about this. Proverbs 28 verse 19. Whoever works with whoever works his land will have plenty of bread. Whoever follows worthless pursuits will have plenty of poverty. You hear that? Proverbs 28, 19, plenty of bread, plenty of wealth, or plenty of poverty. And the difference is whether you work hard on your land or whether you follow worthless pursuits. There are too many men in our community and in our nation who are following worthless pursuits and not demonstrating a significant and solid and consistent work ethic for the glory of God. Proverbs 13 verse 4 says, the soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly supplied. The soul of the sluggard craves but doesn't get anything, but the soul of the diligent is supplied. And then the way that he tells us to look at the ants in Proverbs chapter 6, 
Not like your Aunt Flo, but the little ants that walk around. Uh, He says in Proverbs 6, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider your ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard, when you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. The biblical... uh, story about personal economics, it seems pretty clear to me that poverty is the sort of natural state and that it requires work to gain, uh, to, to, to gain an entrance out of that poverty and to, and, and to gain what we need. And so God calls us to work. Scripture insists on hard work. And Scripture even says that if you work hard, you should enjoy the fruits of your labor. We don't work hard because we love money. But if we work hard, we make money and we get to use that money to store up treasures in heaven, to bless the people around us and to enjoy the life that God's given us. Those who work hard should receive the fruit of their labor. No one should confiscate it from them. Those who do not work, uh, those who can work and who refuse to work shouldn't be incentivized toward greater laziness. That's one of the reasons 2 Thessalonians 3.10 says if someone's able to work and won't, uh, if one won't work, don't let them eat. But at the, at the same time, the scripture insists that an attitude that says, I worked hard for it, so I decide everything I want to do with it, is not the right attitude about money. It's a godless attitude. I earned it and I don't have to share it with anybody is an ungodly attitude. I worked hard for it and now, as a godly woman or man, I want to share it with those around me who have need. So work hard. Don't be lazy. Work hard so you'll have plenty to share with others. That's the third. Now, the fourth point is this. Don't be thoughtless, but plan wisely and live by a budget. And here's a uh, bit of a thesaurus for you. Don't be thoughtless. By thoughtless, I mean impatient or impulsive. Don't be impulsive. Don't be impatient. Don't be thoughtless but plan wisely and live by a budget. Plan wisely and live by a budget. This doesn't exactly come from one Bible verse. I'm just trying to share with you here uh, principles that are biblical from the Proverbs and from the New Testament also about, about living life not out of impulse and not thoughtlessly, but with wisdom as to planning and saving and spending. I would encourage you to live by a budget. A budget, a budget means that you take a piece of paper. I suppose you can do it in an app, but we all know that apps are bad for our souls. So you take a piece of paper and, 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 and you put what your income is and then you, then you write down your expenses and you are careful about the way that those expenses do or don't match up with that income. Make a budget. Don't be thoughtless. Don't be impulsive or impatient, but give wisdom and planning to it. What's coming in and what's going out? It says in 1 Timothy 3 that that an elder must manage his household. This is a big part of managing your household is managing uh, your finances with wisdom and with thoughtfulness. You need a practical plan to live on a budget, to, to, to carve out for giving, saving, Uh, the essential expenses, and then if they're not matching up, you need to find some of those expenses that are not essential and you need to eliminate them. You don't need that, uh, you don't need an entertainment package, you don't need cable, you don't need a nicer phone plan, you don't need to eat out at restaurants, you don't need to buy your clothes new, you can always buy them secondhand. Um, Figure out what what your income is and what your expenses are. Listen, I, I don't know a whole boatload about personal finances, but I have pastored enough people to know this. The issue is not how much you earn. The issue is how you manage what you earn. I know this because I have provided pastoral counsel. I know this because this is a fact. I have provided pastoral counsel to people who, I don't know the exact number, but I'm sure the person I'm providing counsel to makes more than 10 times what I make. And this person's finances are a disaster. 
and a source of unending anxiety and grief in their life. And I, I know I've been pastor to persons, I don't know the exact number, but I've been pastor to persons who certainly make less than half of what I make. But their finances are fine. They're fine. They're a source of joy for them. They're not a source of anxiety or grief for them because they manage what they make and they manage their expenses with care and with thoughtfulness. That's what, that's what I'm calling you to here is to show this kind of wisdom. I suppose a part of this is avoiding debt because if you're impatient or impulsive, you just buy on credit and you get into a lot of debt. Few concepts are more central to the Christian way of thinking than this idea. We defer present desire and comfort for a greater good. So we shouldn't be impatient and impulsive about finances. A, an unrelenting theme of scripture is that we're very willing to, to, to deny ourselves and defer a present desire because we know there's something greater in the future. There are some verses that say to avoid all debt. There are other verses that, especially in the Old Testament, that show how debt can be properly managed. But economically, the issue is if, we, if, if you have to gratify all your desires right now, you're going to end up in debt. And so much of your money will be wasted on interest and carrying charges. But if you waited patiently and saved, instead of being impulsive, you were patient, you'd be in a lot better shape. Impatience says, I cannot wait, I have to have it now. Impulsive spending, impulsive spending says, oh, I saw that, I'm going to get it. There's no planning, there's no saving ahead of time, it's just an impulse purchase. Those are the primary mistakes which lead to exponential trouble down the road as those debts stack up. Now, there may be some debt that's okay, like I said, there are other scripture references that show how debt should be regulated. There may be some types of college loans, maybe some kinds of mortgage. That, that's a, a, a reasonable usage of debt. But probably the worst kind of debt is credit card debt. Maybe the only, the only kind of debt worse than credit card debt is if you literally owed money to Al Pacino and Marlon Brando and The Godfather. Like, that's probably worse. But other than that, it's probably credit card debt is the worst. And that's also the most common form of debt for most of us. And it's brutal. Credit card debt is driven by impulsive purchasing and by, I mean, why would you ever put a, put a vacation or a sweet kitchen remodel, something that doesn't have to happen right now, why, why would you buy that with credit? You want to save and steward wisely toward it. So the question to just ask is, do I carefully steward my spending under the love of God and a desire to please him so that I'm, so, so that I'm, I'm being patient and, and not impulsive? That's the fourth point. I trust that's helpful. And then let me speed along to the fifth point, and that's this. Don't be selfish. Give generously. And this fifth point will allow us to share a little bit about the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The fifth point is this. Don't be selfish. Give generously. Don't be selfish, give generously. Money matters. Not so much because money matters, but money matters because money shows what matters to us. What we give toward shows what matters to us. What we give toward shows what matters to us. For God so loved the world that he gave. We show what we love by what we give toward. This is uh, the primary message in 2 Corinthians 9. In 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 8, it says the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. And then in verse 15 of 2 Corinthians 9, it says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. It says, give generously. And then it ends by saying, thank God for his indescribable gift to us, which is Jesus, our only Lord and Savior. So don't be selfish, 
give generously. And the, just so you know, the New Testament pattern for giving, the regular New Testament pattern for giving is giving that is planned and proportional. Giving that's planned and proportional. Remember in point four, I said, don't be impulsive, but be wise and steward. I, how do I put this without, without saying uh, something that's gonna give our church treasurer heartburn? <laughs> um, we, when we collect the offering, uh, it's not impulsive giving that we're after. Just reach in and throw something in there. It's planned, proportional, regular giving. That's the New Testament pattern. That's what it says here in 2 Corinthians 9 where it says you give as God has provided for you. It says the same thing in 2 Corinthians 8. It probably says it most clearly in 1 Corinthians 16 where he says, uh, where it says, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so also you on the first day of the week, each of you is to put aside and store up as he has prospered so that it may be collected. So this is where we see it's planned and is proportional. So this is like this idea of the tithe, 10%. We're not, we're not under an Old Testament law to tithe. Isn't it? We're not under the... Uh, the theocratic economic program where we have to give 10%. But 10% is a good figure to start with because that's proportional. So if you, if you know that you're, you're going to make about $5,000 a month, you would try to find a way to give about $500 a month. Or if your income for the week is $400, you'd figure out a way to give $40 on the first day of the week to the Lord's work in the church. So not giving that's thoughtless or impulsive, but giving that's proportional and planned. The reason we need to give um, is because God has loved us and this is how we show our response to that love. And by the way, it's the purpose of giving that's why it's good to live on a budget, why it's good to not have a lot of debt. Uh, Debt is usually driven by discontentment which comes from living selfishly. Freedom and joy comes from living selflessly and a contentment that's found in God. Everything shrinks and becomes less fun when self looms large. But everything opens up with joy and generosity when God appears big and self appears small. It sounds crazy to those who don't get it, but to those who get it, This is what Jesus means when he says, give, and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It'll pour over into your lap with the measure with which you're given. It'll be given to you. This is why Jesus says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Acts 20, verse 35. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Miserly people are miserable people. Generous people our joyous people. It is more blessed to give than receive. Think about it this way. It's more blessed to give than receive. Question. It's not a trick question. Who is the most blessed being in the universe? That would be God. It is more blessed to give than to receive. The most blessed being in the universe is God who gave the universe its existence and then gave his only son to redeem the world. And so as we become godly, as we become godly, we enter into the blessedness of the divine life, which is a life of joyful self-giving. This is This is in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 4, they preach the gospel and people get saved. And as soon as people get saved, they start sharing their money with each other. Not because they're pressured to, not because they're arm twisted to, but because when people get saved by God, they begin to become like God. And what they used to call blessing selfish acquisition is no longer blessing for them but now blessing is this agape love of Jesus Christ filling and then overflowing in their life it is more blessed to give than to receive it is more blessed to be saved by grace than to be saved by works 
it is more blessed to be loved by God first than to try to gin up whatever kind of love and sacrifice I can do in my own flesh. This is the good news of the gospel. If you're here and, and, and you're not a part of the church, the, the, the issue of how you spend your money is the caboose. The engine is Jesus Christ has loved you in the gospel. Will you be saved by grace through faith in him? And the best news about the gospel is that it's by grace, that it's not by our works, and that it's free. You ever heard the phrase, the poor man's market? It was a very common phrase in the 1700s and 1800s about gospel preaching churches. It would say gospel preaching churches are the poor man's market because the poor can come into the church and receive everything because the church operates on grace. This sweet phrase, the poor man's market, it comes from Isaiah 55 where God in heaven says, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. And then the God who loves us almost pleads with us. And he says in Isaiah 55 verse 2, Why, oh why, do you spend your money for that which is not bread? Why, oh why, do you labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligent to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in rich food. Come to me and I will make with you an everlasting covenant of love. This is what we have that we have God's love given to us at such cost of the death and resurrection of our Savior, but so freely given to us. If you're not in Christ, oh, come to Christ. You have showed up at the poor man's market and it is time for you to receive. And if you are in Christ, the way that God has generally, generously given to you, this is the way that he now calls you to live. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, show us in this hour of worship what really matters. Heavenly Father, would you dim the brightness of those things that distract us but don't nourish us? Heavenly Father, your people have spent too long eating bread that doesn't satisfy and laboring for riches that moth and rust will destroy. Lord, show us what really matters and fill our lives with your love so that we'll be transformed from the inside out and people will see the kind of God you are when they see the way we live. Lord, hear your children as they pray and bless them for Jesus' sake. Amen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Let's stand and sing together.
now, church, go with this promise of God in your hearts. And my God shall supply your every need according to the glory of his riches in Christ Jesus. Amen.